So for the next uh, couple weeks, we're going to be looking at the idea of white lies. And um, we're going to look at some other things too, like predestina predestination, things like that. But uh, the main overriding thing that we're going to look at is white lies. Now, everybody knows what a lie is, right? You know, uh, you, you lie. I mean, you, you, you tell something that's not true. Well, a white lie is a little game that kids play where they see how close they can get to lying without it actually being lying. So they say stuff like, oh, well, I, I kind of said sort of the truth or it wasn't totally a lie. You know, they, they say these little things that like, oh, no, it's it's not as bad. No, because you can't get me in trouble because I didn't really lie. You know, and they're like they're, they're like basically considered small lies. They don't hurt anybody, and uh, the problem is is that Christians <laughs> tell little little white lies. They'll uh, they'll they'll say things like, "Oh, well, the Bible says it, and I stand in faith about something that the Bible doesn't really say." You know, and and or they'll misquote what the Bible says, and then they'll stand on their misunderstanding. And oh no, I'm standing in faith, and it's like no, you're you're standing in a lie because you're not listening to what the Bible is actually trying to tell you. Um, and this has become very common, where you know we as Christians are believing these little white lies, and it's, oh, it's not it's not really wrong, and I don't really see the difference, and you know we we lie to ourselves about the lie itself, and it just gets to be kind of a um, well, just a dangerous place to be in because we start loving lies more than the truth, and those little lies give way to bigger lies. And we're going to look at a couple of those. Um, one of the problems that I think comes in this is that we become a, 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 a people that don't really specialize in anything. We don't really um, understand any. Like, let me let me say that differently. We don't have like none of us really know a field. So what we do is we search online and we find an we find a website or something that supports what what we want to believe and hey it sounds legit too and then we say something like well i researched it and you know our 5 minutes of quote unquote researching it <laughs> is more like just you looked for to see if there was an if there was somebody online that agreed with your position basically um, you weren't going to find truth, to find answers. No, you were just going to uh, see if there was something that, that is going to validate the view that you always, you already wanted to believe. Um, and so, because we don't really like, for instance, what I mean by we, we don't really specialize in anything is. We, for instance, don't understand how archaeology works or how history works. We don't really understand the basics of it. But we search online and we find something that kind of justifies what we want to believe. And we're like, ha see? And this is, you know, I researched it. This is the answer. And it's like, well, you know, very few things in history and archaeology are that open and closed. And that's kind of what I'm talking about is you can find anything online to back up any view, any crazy thing you think of. Um, there's actually a joke um, that that is you know out and about with with kids uh, called the rule 34 joke and the idea is this that if it exists there's a porn of it and the same is true for crazy theories too if if you can think up a crazy theory it exists somewhere out there already so you can find anything that supports you know what you want to believe it's very important that you you know maybe you don't you don't have to necessarily specialize in every field to become a you know a master at history for instance but it there it, there does seem to be some basic groundwork where you understand how much you don't understand and you understand um, you know what kind of criteria to look for um, um, especially because we're dealing with things that we don't know. I researching something is not reading about it for a couple for a couple hours or weeks. That's that's not researching it. Um, we're talking about things that people spend lifetimes lifetimes studying and you know months and years studying. Um, you see this kind of come out in another area too is uh, how we Google things. You know, what, what does the Bible say about this? And then because the Bible doesn't say anything specific about that because, you know, it was written 2,000 years ago, uh, <laughs> we say, okay, the Bible doesn't say anything about that. So it, it's, it's okay to do it or vice versa. It's not okay to do it. Well, you, you, can't, you can't Google an answer like that. Sometimes there'll be an answer that you can only find through constant studying of the Bible. And uh, so there's just a kind of a, kind of a, big, a big gap there between, um, <laughs> between uh, what the Bible actually says and what we kind of want to believe. So I, now let's look at the first white lie that we're going to gonna consider. Um, and, you know, it, it's said in a bunch of different ways. So these are just three different ways that it's oftentimes said. All things work out for good in the end. Or everything is going to be okay. 
or it'll work itself out. You know, these are things that we tell people who are going through hard times, and, and we even mean it, like, in a, in a good way. We mean it in a way that will encourage them, in a way that we will build them up, in a way that, okay, well, you know, this will give them a little bit of hope, a little bit of relief from their pain. But the problem is it's, it's a very, very shallow thing because it's not totally true. Um, and, and that's the problem is surely we can find a way to encourage people without resorting to things that aren't really true. Um, so let's let's look at uh, let's look at this. Um, I, while you're listening to this, just think about the f let's just say one or two really traumatic things that you've had to go through. These are really painful things, um, things that even now you might still be going through, or you might still be dealing with the consequences of. Just things that things that really made a, a big impact on your life in, in a negative way. Um, maybe like the death of a loved one, for instance, or you know something where you were blamed for something that you didn't do, or just you know something that was really world changing for you. Think about those, just one or two of them. The first one or two that pop in your head, the most traumatic and painful things you've lived through. Now, I want you to ask the basic question: Were they good? Were those things that happened in them in and of themselves good? Is it good to see a loved one die? Is it good to live with pain or to see someone you love live with pain? Is it good to be blamed for something that you didn't do? And now follow that question up with this. Did they magically work out? Did they just, oh, problem resolved? Well, if you've lived any amount of time, you know that no, they don't just magically work out. Oftentimes you have to adapt your life and deal with it as a constant factor. Like for instance, when you lose a loved one, you have to deal with the fact that they're gone forever. There's no way that that becomes okay. You might make peace with the problem. Yes, you, you might make peace with it, but that doesn't mean that it was a good thing. That doesn't mean that it magically worked out. So let's look at this white lie again and just our own conscience and experience and, and just common sense. All things work out for good in the end. No, not necessarily. That's just not true. Everything is going to be okay. No, it's not always going to be okay. It'll work itself out. Um, whereas there are a lot of situations which, you know, if you don't if you don't freak out and you just kind of weather the storm, they have a way of working themselves out. Not everything will work itself out. And I wonder how much of life is really um, works itself out versus there were people and God uh, that was working it out. Maybe maybe it's not accurate to say it'll work itself out so much as if people take the initiative, or God decides to, it works out. So let's look at really the inception of this, you know, just terrible lie, a white lie. You know, it's not really, really a lie. It comes from Romans 8.28, and the part of the problem is because of the KJV. The KJV has, has made a lot of things tradition, um, and because of its age, you know, people just kind of, kind of cave to it on the way it translates stuff. And uh, even to the point of it just not really being accurate. Um, so e the ESV does the exact same thing as the KJV uh, in this verse. In this verse. So we're going to look at it, and I want you to pay attention to this, okay? And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. just It just magically works together. And here's the KJV. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are called according to his purpose. So it kind of has a little bit of a qualifier more clearly uh, said in the KJV maybe. Uh, that, you know, hey, everything's going to work out, you know, but as so long as you love God. Okay. Um, kind of vague. So let's look at the NASB and the NIV. These both say it a lot more accurately and just a lot better of a translation. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. See, they don't, they're not just magically working themselves out. God is actually doing something to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, let's, let's look at the NIV. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. See, in both of these verses, they get it, that God is the one causing these things to work to the good. It, they're not just magically going to go away. God's going to maybe use it, okay, that that's good. But f to say that it's just magically going to work itself out just because you love God, that's just not accurate. God is going to work these things out. So let's let's look at this. There's three main points that I want to make about what this what this verse is saying. First off, God is the one doing the working. 
it, it, look at this. God causes these things to, to work for the good. See this? Uh, you, you, the NASB is the one that says causes. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. He doesn't cause all things to happen. Now, wh what does that mean? Well, that means that he allows some things to happen, or he allows other people to do things, free will, for instance, which we'll look at this in just a minute. Well, actually, we're going to look at it next week, uh, the idea of free will and predestination. Um, but maybe he'll you know, let people do things that aren't good. Maybe he'll let people do things that aren't really his will. Uh, maybe he will, um, you know, stuff like that. So, okay, not necessarily, this verse is not saying God causes all things. Now, I don't want to get too far off topic here, but the main point being that whatever the cause of the thing that you're going through, God can work it for good. So that's the first thing. God is the one doing the working. The second point that I want to, that I want to point out from this passage is that this is not a promise for everyone in the whole world. Hey, it's just going to work itself out because of Romans 8:28. It clearly says for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. So this is kind of a back and forth, you know, between God saving us and us being saved. Now, this really connects with Romans 8, 29, and 30, which we're, we're going to look at predestination next week. But this is just uh, the basic idea that we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So you can see there the NIV and the NASB are real similar. So those are the first two things I want to point out. God is the one that causes it to work to the good. It doesn't just magically work itself out. Second off... He does this for his people, not for everyone. This is not a promise for all people for all time. This is a promise for his people that he's going to use these things for the good. So then that brings up the big question. Now, if, if, if you've gone through really heartbreaking situations, you know not everything is good. And you know that it doesn't just magically become good. So that, that brings us to the basic question in the context of Romans 8.28. What is good? What is good? There are three ways that we typically um, describe good. The first off is, is it pleasurable? Is it something that I enjoy doing? The second way, is, is it wealthy? Is it going to make me um, make me benefit in some way? The third way is, does it contribute to my health, to my longevity of life, to my satisfaction of life? So those are the three things that we typically give as a qualifier of something that's good. It either feels good, or it benefits me, or it makes me it, it makes me win in the long run somehow. So pleasure, wealth, and, and health. Those are the, the, the three ways that we typically call something good. But is that really accurate? Let's 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 take a good example. Let's say let's say I sell one of my children into the sex trade. Okay. Now I'm going to profit in a sense of wealth, uh, riches, which um, one of the yammers brought up in, when I taught this lesson last night. That wealth isn't always money. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Well, will this help me, you know, become more wealthy in the sense of friends or family? So, okay, all right. Um, but with that being said, in this example, we'll, we'll stick with the with riches. Will I personally benefit as far as money by selling my child? Yes. My health? Well, it would be a lot less stressful to to only have to deal with myself than have to deal with other people. I mean, anybody knows this. Taking care of kids is a lot of work. So then. Would it result in my pleasure? Well, you know, I would have less time to spend on others and more time on me. See what I mean? Does that mean that that thing is good, that it is good to sell my child? Do you, do you, see, do you see how this is a woefully inadequate idea of what is good? You can't base what is good off of whether you enjoy the experience or whether you profit from the experience. You, you, you can't narrow goodness to that. Maybe it is God, maybe in fact it is God's desire and plan that you go through something that's unpleasurable, that you go through something that you end up poor, either in well and finances or in friends and family. 
Maybe it's God's planning that brought you to a place of not being in good health. How do you deal with that? What if God's idea of what is my ult for my ultimate good is different than my idea of what's my temporary good? The world does not rev like the world doesn't revolve around me, and God's plans don't resol revolve around my earthly experiences. Life isn't fair. God brings all of us to different places. Some of us have to deal with cancer. Some of us have to deal with burying a child. Some of us have to deal with losing a job, not having a place to live. These are just things in life that we have to go through. In this life, there will be troubles. That's something that God promises us. So then what does this possibly mean that he's working it to good? Well, the first thing that I want to, before I go to the final answer, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden the thing becomes good in and of itself. God has a way of taking a bad situation and using it for a good end, for a good purpose. Okay, like for instance, um, we could think of uh, Corrie ten Boom, you know, who went through very traumatic situations in, in World War II uh, time frame, and then from that she was able to do a lot of good, not only in her suffering before the concentration camp, but also in the concentration, then after the concentration camp. You know, and so the, the thing is, what is good? Well, it can't be defined as what's pleasurable, what, re, 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 what results in my wealth or health. So if we continue reading in Romans chapter 8, we, we see the bigger picture. For those God foreknew, he also predestined, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And these, those he, uh, pre, he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. We'll look at that next week, so don't really worry about that part. This is the part that I want you to get. The idea of what is good and the context of Romans chapter 8, verse 28 is it, it grows us into the image of Christ. It helps us to change See, God foreknew, he knew who would be saved before we were ever born. And for those people who he knew were going to be saved, he predestined. What that means is he planned ahead before we ever got there for the situation to be for our benefit. Not that he caused the situation, but that he planned for it to benefit us. Okay, did you get that? He, he, he knew who would be saved. And he, that means that anything that you go through right now, God knew that you were going to go through. It's not a surprise to God. That means that everything that you go through, it didn't catch God by surprise that he can use literally anything to help you grow in character. It didn't catch him by surprise. He knew what was coming. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that's a very comforting thought. That no matter what, how I feel that God can use this tragedy, this my greatest tragedy, he can use to help me grow in character. And ultimately, that, that's better than being in constant pleasure, in constant wealth, or in constant health. That's better. See, you can be on your deathbed and be more content and have a better character than the richest man in the world. Wealth doesn't make you... A good person. But God knew who would be saved, and he planned for the things that we were going through to work to our betterment, to our good. So there's a few things that I, I want to say that will help us to kind of shed light on this, um, on this, on this white lie. First off, God uses the things we go through to work character on us. God knows what we go through and planned it to benefit us. I'm sorry, planned for it to benefit us. Pain will oftentimes seem pointless and hopeless, and oftentimes in and of itself it is. You go through situations that don't have a reason, they don't have a purpose, they don't make sense. You hear people say all the time, oh, well, it happened for a reason. Not necessarily. Maybe it didn't happen for a reason. Maybe it is a pointless and hopeless situation. But God gives your pain purpose, but God uses it to grow you. See, God takes a hopeless and pointless situation, and he gives it a purpose. You see the difference there? Now, 
even the way that we say that, oh, well, you know, it happened for a reason. It, we try and, and make sense out of a world that doesn't make sense. And so then God comes along and he gives it meaning, gives it a point for us. Now, as we go forward uh, in the next uh, couple weeks, we're going to look at um, the idea of predestination, predestination or free will. Do we have predestined? Are we predestined or do we have free will? And uh, especially since it, as it came up in the context of this first white lie, and then uh, the probably the week after that, we'll look at uh, the second of the white lies that I wanted to um, focus in on. So, uh, okay, I'll see you next time.